Hey guys, welcome to day three of my Halloween movie marathon. Before we get things going, to celebrate, I'm very excited to be doing a Universal Monsters Funko Pop unboxing. Let's go. Yes. Yes. Okay, so first, we have Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster. Next up, we have Bella Lugosi as Dracula. Okay, and finally, we have... Where's... Where's Claude Rains as the Invisible Man? Where's... Did they... Did they not send me the Invisible Man? Did... Oh! <laughs> Here it is. Claude Rains as the Invisible Man. Welcome to Teacup for One. My name is Matt and I have two degrees. For today's film, we are going to be watching our first Universal Monster movie. However, the creature in today's film is one of the less popular Universal Monsters. He kind of takes a back seat to the more visible monsters. For example, Frankenstein or Dracula. Dare I say, the title character is... Invisible? It's, it's, it's the Invisible Man. We're talking about the Invisible Man. Claude Rains was the Invisible Man. And then something went wrong for Fay Ray and King Kong. They got caught in a celluloid jam. We'll get to that. So today we're talking about why the Invisible Man is basically a hobbit. But first, boring context. The Invisible Man is based on the serialized 1897 novel of the same name by H.G. Wells of the Time Machine fame. The novel is about a brilliant scientist who figures out a formula to turn himself invisible. And in doing so, he begins a reign of murder and terror and uh, has plans for world domination, claiming that one day invisible men will rule the world. Power! Power to rule! To make the world grovel at my feet! The uh, chemical that makes him invisible. Messed with his head a little bit. <laughs> in terms of his life on film, the Invisible Man joined the family of Universal Monsters in 1933, following Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Mummy. But as far as I'm concerned, his movie holds up the best out of the four. And I mean, to be fair, I honestly don't think those other three films have aged that well, so the bar was not very high. But The Invisible Man is a bleepin' awesome movie. Now, don't get me wrong, the title characters in Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Mummy, and the actors portraying them, they are all fantastic. But The Invisible Man is just a step above the others because it really retains all of the themes and ideas that H.G. Wells was exploring in his original novel and uses them to create a really groundbreaking and terrifying movie. And I mean, to be fair, it probably makes a huge difference that H.G. Wells was still alive when this film was being made, so he can kind of keep a watch over it. Same really can't be said for Bram Stoker or Mary Shelley, so... Eh. On top of that, the special effects in this film were absolutely groundbreaking, and for the most part, they still hold up as being really impressive today just through a combination of wire work and composite shots. Also, remember that this was shot before blue screen and green screen technology were a thing, so it wasn't as easy as just putting Claude Rains in a blue or green bodysuit and then filming him and using a computer to take out the blue or the green. No, 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 no. Anytime the Invisible Man was seen wearing clothes with no visible body, they had to record Claude Rains in a full black velvet bodysuit, which, kinky, against a fully black background so that the camera negative would only pick up the clothes. And then that shot, after the fact, would be superimposed or composited or cinematography terms, I don't know, over top of a separate shot of the background. It, very, very complicated. But none of those special effects would mean anything if the story and the performances weren't so good. Now, originally, The Invisible Man was supposed to be played by Boris Karloff, aka Frankenstein's monster. But the producer kept on wanting to cut down his salary to the point where Karloff said, no thank you, and stepped away. And so they cast a completely unknown stage actor from England known as Claude Rains. Claude Rains was the Invisible Man. Claude Rains had only done one silent film prior. This was his first time acting in a movie, and he did an incredible job because he was cast purely on the merits 
of his voice. Because, spoiler alert, you never see the Invisible Man until the last frame of the movie when he's dead. And so, the most important thing was finding an actor who had a beautiful sounding voice, but who was a strong enough performer that he could make the text and the performance read purely through his voice. And he absolutely does that. Power to walk into the gold vaults of the nations, into the secrets of kings, into the holy of holies. Power to make multitudes run squealing in terror at the touch of my little invisible finger. He is fantastic. Good job, Claude Rains. But, but, but. The main reason this film is so effective is because, well, to put it bluntly, invisibility is bleepin' terrifying. But this isn't anything new. In fact, it goes all the way back to Plato's Republic. Also, pause, time out. If you watch my Talking Animal movie, you know that I am really not the right person whatsoever to be casually citing Plato, or philosophy for that matter. I've only taken one philosophy course in my life, and I almost failed it. But this concept, I think, is straightforward enough for me to talk about it. But you tell me. In a debate about justice, Plato claims that humans are only behaving and only following rules because of accountability. But everyone recognizes that there is more profit to be made in unjust actions. To hit that point home, he tells a story about a magical ring that when worn will imbue its wearer with the power of invisibility. I feel like J.R.R. Tolkien definitely read Plato's Republic. And he says it wouldn't matter if you gave the invisibility ring to a virtuous man or a criminal because in the end, their actions would be exactly the same. Because no man would keep his hands off what was not his own when he could safely take what he liked out of the market, or go into houses and lie with anyone at his pleasure, or kill, or release from prison whom he would, and in all respects, be like a god among men. Now, I'm not saying that J.R.R. Tolkien ripped off Plato, but Lord of the Rings does perfectly illustrate this concept with Smeagol and with Bilbo. Before he was Gollum, his name was Smeagol and he was a bad hobbit, but then we've also got Bilbo and he's a good hobbit. They both come into possession of the One Ring, they both feel the power of invisibility, and they are both affected the exact same way. Admittedly, obviously, Gollum is affected much more than Bilbo because he has more time with the ring and therefore more time to deteriorate. But in the end, both hobbits become obsessed with the power of the ring and consequently the power that they feel it grants them. And that is what makes invisibility so terrifying. It strips us of all accountability and gives us free reign to act on the impulses that we would normally be working to suppress. It gives us power and status over everyone through the ultimate form of voyeurism. And I feel like that's really why characters in literature who toy with invisibility usually end up losing control of their sanity. Of course, there are always extra narrative details just sprinkled in there to further justify a character's descent into madness. The One Ring has its psychic connection to Sauron, so it's poisoning the poor hobbits' his minds. In The Invisible Man, insanity is actually a side effect of the key chemical used in the invisibility formula. But at its core, these stories are exposing what people are capable of when they are given free reign to be free. And if you want a less fantastical but equally relevant example of this, just look at internet trolls. Under the veil of anonymity, 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 an when people are anonymous, they let themselves be a lot more cruel. When you look at Universal's other monsters, they're all representing society in one way or another, but the Invisible Man is representing all of us, which I guess is technically society, but he's more so like representing the individual and what every person is capable of. And it makes us question, what would I do if I were invisible? What am I capable of? And that's terrifying, whether it's you, someone you know, or a hobbit. But for now, friends, that concludes yet another episode of Teacup for One. Let me know in the comment section, who is your favorite universal monster? And if you want to follow me on this journey of Halloween movies every day of the month, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. It's super easy. All you need to do is click on my face. Thanks for joining me again today, everyone. My name is Matt, and I have two degrees, and that's the T, Cup for One. <laughs>